Yes, um, in the previous three lectures, I have talked about the production of slags in metallurgy. I have talked about the production of uh, actually, you know, making slags iron. In my second uh, lecture, I just I discuss about the process of making uh, slag and the chemical composition of uh, getting slags or uh, producing iron. And in my second lesson, I treat, I discuss about the extraction of uh, or iron ores and uh, the process it went through for you know extraction to refinery and how we refine the ore. Um, in my third lesson, so I discuss about the the process of making of uh, making production of iron and slag and uh, and uh, and making of slags. So I have addressed three lectures. I've given three lectures. This is the fourth lecture. In this first lecture, I'm basically going to discuss mainly about the blast furnace itself and the chemical compositions of the blast furnace. A little bit of history about blast furnaces and all, all the furnaces that we have had. I discuss about basement shortly, or maybe in my first uh, lesson, but not really going into details about basement process. Um, in here, on that, you know, production of uh, uh, steel, you need uh, either the blast furnace, or open heart uh, blast furnace first, open heart uh, uh, steel making, oxygen converter steel making, uh, electric arc steel making, uh, foundry, foundry which is the, consists of the forging and so on and so forth. And the rolling mills. In rolling mills, there are also different sections of rolling mills. You have the uh, the the tube making. You have the flat sheets. You have the rolling mills. You have the rods, wire rods, and all those things is something that all you know entails in the in the in metallurgy. So I'm gonna take my time to give less lecture on uh, every stages of metallurgy, so that uh, those of you who have the time to review. Uh, the lecture or if you go into a classroom or into a lecture hall and your professor teaches you something about methodology that you're not clear you can use my lecture as a reference point uh, since uh, uh, I am very skilled in methodology and uh, I want to make sure that I leave this piece of lecture for our youths uh, who you know I Pray that Nigeria embark on steel production very seriously. So this my lectures will serve as a reference point to so many people who may have difficulties in understanding the concept of metallurgy. So um, the more the, the more you listen to my lecture, the better you become a metallurgist yourself, even if you don't have a degree in metallurgy. Um, there are a lot of chemical engineers who are very skillful in metallurgy because of uh, you know their field as a chemistry as a chemist. So they are very skillful because uh, you know it's uh, based on their uh, chemical compositions and reactions and so on and so forth. That's what we use as a metallurgy. Is uh, we have the combination of the mechanical metallurgy actually consists of the mechanical part of engineering and chemistry uh, chemical part of engineering. So we combine both to form our own metallurgical engineering. So um, most. Uh, Metallurgical engineer are good. It should be relatively okay in chemistry and uh, mechanical. So we have that those combination. So let me quickly go into giving you a brief synopsis, and uh, I just piggyback on the, on the previous lessons that I on the three lectures that I have given. So those those are just a, a piggyback on those lectures for you to be able to know exactly. What it what mythology is all about, and uh, basically to make sure I broaden your knowledge about mythology, uh, so that you will not get confused or uh, saying, "Oh, the subject is hard." It's not. If you just understand and study chemistry well and do a little bit of physics and mathematics, you'll be fine. Mythology is one of the interesting subjects uh, in the engineering field. Uh, you know, some people even chemical engineering is also very interesting, but you have to have a grip of chemistry and uh, have a grip of uh, 
a little bit of mathematics and the physics, and then you'll be fine. You know, no problem about that. Okay, let me begin to define the, what a metallurgy is all, a blast furnace is all about. A blast furnace is a type of metallurgical furnace used for smelting to produce industrial metals, generally iron, basically. So we produce other things, but the main thing was to produce uh, to get iron. You know, blast furnace produce what we call pig iron. Now, in a blast furnace, fuel ore and flux, which is the limestone, flux is called the limestone, are continuously suspended, supplied through the top of the furnace. So we supply all the, uh, the limestone and other things that you know, uh, other things that is needed in the blast furnace through the tap. So uh, through the top of the furnace, while air, sometimes with oxygen enrichment, is blown into the lower sections of the furnace. So there's uh, on the lower section of the furnace, there's a tube, and uh, we blow air into it to, to kind of pump it to energize the heat that is the chemical reactions that is going on there and you know, supply the heat to create the chemical reactions and to ensure that uh, we are doing the exact thing. So, uh, so that the chemical re uh, reactions take place through the furnace as the material moves downward. Now, the end products are usually molten metal and slag faces. So and uh, the end method, the end, the uh, end products. That's what we get now. Is we get a multi metal, and you get what slags. Slag was supposed to be the residues. I let me pick it back on my previous lesson, my lecture. Is it supposed to be uh, the uh, the residue of uh, this thing? But this slags are also very important in the uh, bridge constructions, as I have said in my previous lessons. In the road construction and all those things, you know, you know it's, it, it has a, a very high uh, resistance to uh, tearing, wearing, and uh, so that's why it is really used in bridges and and uh, in construction. So it's, it's so nothing goes to waste in metallurgy. So let me continue with that. The end products are usually multi metal and slag faces tapped from the bottom and through gases existing from the top of the furnace. The downward flow of the ore and flux in contact with the upflow of hot carbon monoxide rich combustion gases is a countercurrent exchange process. Now, blast furnaces are to be co uh, contrasted with air furnaces, such as liberatory furnaces, which were uh, naturally aspirated. Usually by the conversion of hot gases in the in the chimney flue. So in the chimney flue, <clears throat> according to the uh, the broad definition, bloomeries of iron, which is called we call them blooms. So the bloomeries of iron blowing houses for tin and smelt mills for lead will be classified as blast furnace. However, the term has usually been limited to those used for smelting iron ore to produce pig iron and intermediate material used in the production of commercial and steel. So in, in this case, uh, dealing with the blast bodies, we're going to talk about the, the history of, of blast bodies. I will talk about the history of blast bodies. I will talk about the modern process. I will talk about the manufacture, manufacture stone wool. I will talk about the commission blast furnace as museum site, and, and and those are the five major categories that I will deal with it. We deal with in this lecture today, in this uh, uh, lecture today. So you know, if you await, the, the, I'm moving now to the history. So I'm going to discuss more about the history of blast furnace. History of Lemos metallurgy. Blast furnace exist existed in China from about. 5th century uh, BC, which is before Christ. And in the West, from the High Middle Ages, they spread from the region around Namul in Wallonia, Belgium. In the late 15th century, being introduced to England in, 19, in 1491, the fuel used in this was invariably charcoal. In those days, they used charcoal. 
the successful substitution, uh, substitution of coke from charcoal is widely attributed to Abraham Darby. So in this case, we move from charcoal, using charcoal to, for blast models, now we use coal. So, and the person who was responsible, the scientist who was responsible for the driving, moving from charcoal to coal was uh, Abraham Darby. So I, I want, and it, this was, this happened in 1709. The efficiency of the process was further enhanced by the practice of preheating the combustion air, hot blast, uh, patented by James uh, Beaumont Nelson in 1828. So, so I'm going to move, this is a brief synopsis of the history. Now I'm going to move to the, uh, the China when it was formed in China in the 15th century. So let's just discuss how the Chinese uh, they, you know, came, were the first person to actually use blast furnace. The oldest extant blast furnace were built during the Han Dynasty of China in the first century BC. However, cast iron farm tools and weapons were widespread in China by the 5th century BC. While 3rd century BC, iron smelter employed, employed an average workforce of over 200 men. These early furnaces had clay walls and used phosphorus containing minerals as a flux. The effectiveness of the Chinese blast furnace was enhanced during this period by the engineer Du Xi, so which is up uh, AD, uh, 31 AD who applied the power of uh, waterways of piston blows in forging cast iron. Now, while it was long through the Chinese had developed the blast furnace and cast iron and, and, and the uh, first method of iron production, Donald Wagner, the author of the above reference, uh, 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 the author of the one of the reference book in uh, in uh, in metallurgy, has published a more recent paper that su uh, supersedes some of the statements in the earlier work. The newer paper still places the date of the first cast iron antipas at the fourth and fifth centuries BC, but during the beginning of the Chinese uh, Bronze Age of the late. Uh, Lux, Luxan culture, which is 2000 BC, he suggests that early blast furnace and cast iron production evolved from furnaces used to make bronze. Certainly, through iron was though certainly though iron was essential to military success by the time the state of Gi had unified China, which is. 221 BC. By the 11th century, this, the Song Dynasty, Chinese iron industry, made a remarkable switch of resource, resources from charcoal to bituminous coal in casting iron and steel, spearing thousands of acres of woodland from felling. This may have happened as early as the 4th, 4th century AD, that's after the death of Christ. Now, let's look at the Chinese blast furnace remain in, the, in, in use well until the 20th century. The backyard furnaces favored by Mao Zedong during the Great Leap Forward were of, were of this type in the regions with strong traditions of metallurgy. It, the steel production actually increased during the period. In the region where there was tradition of steel making or where the, info, where the iron masters knowing the traditional skills on the scientific principles of the blast furnace process had been killed, the results were less and less than satisfactory. Elsewhere in ancient world, let's look at elsewhere in ancient world, the history, the, the bloomery. In, mo in most places, 
in the world other than in China, other than in China, <clears throat> there is no evidence of the use of blast furnace proper. Instead, iron was made by direct reduction in bloomeries. That's, they call it blooms. These are not correctly described as blast furnace, though the term is occasionally misused in referring to them. An exception will be higher people of northwestern Tanzania, who are renowned for creating a still using blast furnace process and refining process very similar to open heart process for possibility as long as 200 year, 2,000 years. In Europe, the Greeks, uh, Celts, Romans, and Carthaginians all used this process. Several examples had been found in France and materials found in Tunisia suggest they were used there as well as in Antioch, South Century Turkey, between Syria and uh, Mediterranean Sea, during the Hellenistic uh, period, though little is known of, of, of it during the Dark Ages. The process probably continued in, in use, similarly smelting in bloomery type furnaces in West Africa and forging for tools appear in North culture in Africa by 200 BC. The reason why they're calling Africa is because in Africa we have blast meats and the blast meats also are using the same method of blast furnace in casting iron on, on the molding different kind of structure. That's why. The Earliest records of bloomery, even in Okene, so uh, for the Ibera people, you know, we have the blacksmiths in our place, so that's a perfect example. So, earliest records of bloomery type furnaces, East Africa, are discover discovery of smelted iron and carbon in Nubia and Oxum that date back between 1000 to uh, 500 BCE. Particularly in Mero, there are known to have been ancient bloomeries that produce metal tools for the Nubians and uh, Kushitis and produce surplus for their economy. Bloomeries have also been discovered and recorded to have been created in me medieval West Africa with some of the metalworking Bantu civil uh, civilizations, such as. Bunioro Empire and the Nioro people. Medieval Europe, Catalan to, uh, for, forges. The simple forge known as the uh, Corsican was used prior to uh, Christianity. An improved bloomery named the Catalan forge, known as as the structure as the uh, stockophone in German meaning the war furnace, was invented in Catalonia, Spain, during the 8th century. Instead of using natural drought, air was pumped in by billows, by billows resulting in better quality iron and increased capacity. The pumping of air stream in, in with billows is known as cold blast and it increases the fuel efficiency of the bloomery and improves yield. The Catalan forge can also be viewed bigger than natural drought bloomeries. Modern experimental archaeology and history. Reenactment have shown there is only a very short step from a Catalan forge of the blast furnace where the iron is gained as pig iron in liquid phase. Usually, obtaining the iron in liquid phase is actually undesired. And the temperature is intentionally kept below the melting point of iron. Since while removing the solid bloom mechanically in is tedious and means batch process instead of continuous process, it is almost pure iron and can be worked immediately. On the other hand, pig iron is the 
eutectic mixture of carbon ion and needs to be de uh, decarboni decarbonized to produce steel or wrought iron, which was extremely tedious in the Middle Ages. So that's where you have a problem because the iron itself you know, mixed mix with carbon and it is very difficult to separate the iron and carbon. They don't even, so that's why you have de defects in, uh, in iron casting in those days. Now, oldest European blast furnace. The oldest known blast furnace in the West were built in Dostel in Switzerland, the Marquisches uh, Sutherland in Germany, and Lapitan in Sweden, where the complex was active between uh, 1150 and 1350 at Noraskog Norask in the Swedish parish of uh, Jamboas. There have also been found traces of blast furnace dated even earlier, possibly to around 1100, uh, 1100 BC or, or AD, 1100 BC. This early blast furnace, like the Chinese example, were very inefficient compared to those used today. The iron, the iron from the Lapitan complex was used to produce balls of wrought iron, known as osmods. And these were used to produce balls of wrought iron known as osmos and were traded internationally as still being sold to other countries. A possible reference occurs in a treaty with Novogorod, Novo, uh, Novgorod from 1203 uh, and several certain reference in accounts of English custom from the 1250 and 1320s. Other furnaces of the 13th to 15th centuries have been identified in Westphalia. The provenance of the technology is not certain. One possibility involving technology transfer from China, Al Calvini in the 13th century, and other travelers subsequently noted an iron industry in the Albos. Uh, in the Albos Mountains to the south of the uh, Caspian Sea. This is close to the Silk Route, so that the use of technology derived from China is conceivable. Much later dis descriptions record blast furnaces about three meters high. As the, as the reach Sweden by this means, However, since blast furnace has also been invented independently in Africa by the higher people, it is more likely the, the process has been invented in Scandinavian independently. The step from bloomery to true blast furnace is not is not big. It's not big. The Caspian region may also separately be the technological source for a furnace at Ferrero, described by Filare, water poured below at uh, Semogo in northern Italy in, in 1226, in two stages process. In this, the molten iron was tapped twice a day into water there by granulating it. Let's look at Christensian contribution. Under the crustacean contribution, one means by which certain technological advances were transmitted with Europe was as a result of the general chapter of the uh, Cetacean Marks. This may have included the blast furnace as the Cetacean are known to have been skilled metallurgists. According to Jean Gippel, their high level of industrial technology facilitated the diffusion of new techniques. Every monastery had a, a model of factory, often as large as the church and only several feet away, and water power drove the machinery of the various industries located on its floor. Iron ore deposits were often donated to the monks 
along with forges to extract the iron. And with time, surplus were being offered for sale. The Custation became the leading iron producer in Champagne, France, from the, 13th, from the mid 13th century to the 17th century. Also, using the first phase slag from their furnaces as an agricultural fertilizer. So, I told you the slags is never a waste. You have, you have to, we have to always use it to, you know, either as a fertilizer, either as a, as a road, road construction, you know, in so many things. Archaeologists are still discovering the extent of uh, Cistercian technology. At an outstation of uh, Renubis Abbey, and the only medieval blast furnace so far identified in Britain, the slag produced was low in iron content. Slag from other furnaces of the time could co contain a substantial concentration of iron, whereas last in, is believed to have produced cast iron quite efficiently. It is, its date is not yet clear, but, it's probably did not, it, but it, it probably did not survive until Henry Vios, the solutions of the Mauritanian. Mouse stations in the late uh, 1530s. As an agreement immediately after that concerning the uh, smites with the old rootland in 1541 refers to blooms. Nevertheless, the means by which the blast furnace spread in medieval, medieval Europe has not finally been determined. Let's look at the origin and spread of early modern blast furnaces. Now, to address this, the direct ancestor of this use in France and England was in the Namo region, in what is now Wallonia, Belgium. From there, they spread first to the Pays de Bray on the eastern Boundary of Nomadi and from the Wheel of Success, where the first furnace called Queenstock in Boxter was built in about 1491, followed by one at Newbridge in Ashdown Forest in 1496. They remain few in number until about 1530. But many were built in the following decades in the world where the iron industry perhaps reached its peak about 1590. Most of the peak iron from these furnaces was taken to finery forges for the production of barium. <clears throat> now, the first British furnace outside the world appeared during the uh, 1550s, and many were built in the uh, in the remained, rem remainder of the century and the following ones. The output of the industry probably peaked about 1620, and was followed by a slow decline until the early 18th century. This was apparently because it was more economic to import iron from Sweden and elsewhere than to make it in some more remote British location. Charcoal that was economically available to the industry was probably being consumed as fast as the wood to make it grow. The Bancaro blast furnace built in Cumbia in 1711 has been des described as the first efficient example. Coke blast furnace. In 1709 at Coke Brookdale at Coke Brookdale in uh, Schrumpfier, England, Abraham Darby began to fuel a blast furnace with a Coke instead of charcoal. Coke's initial advantage was its low, lower cost, mainly because 
Making coke requires much less labor than cutting trees and making charcoal. Metallurgical coke will also bear heavier weight than charcoal, allowing larger furnace. A disadvantage is that coke contains more impurities than charcoal, with sulfur being especially detrimental to the iron's quality. Now, coke iron was initially only used for foundry work making pots and other cast iron goods. Foundry work was a minor branch of the industry of metallurgy. But Darby Son built a new furnace at nearby Hoshby and began to supply the owners of finery forges with coke, pig iron, and the productions of the bar iron. Coke pig iron was by this time cheaper to produce than charcoal pig iron. The use of coal-derived fuel in the iron industry was a key factor in British Industrial uh, Revolution. Derby's orig origin blast furnace has been archaeologically excavated and can be seen in situ at Bliss Hill, Coal Brookdale, part of the Inner Bridge Gorge Museum. Cast iron from the furnace was used to make uh, guidance for the world's first iron bridge in 1779. The iron bridge crosses the river Seven, the, uh, the, the seven at uh, Brook, uh, Cobrook, uh, Cobrookdale and remains in use for pedestrians. A further important development was the the change to hot blast. The change to hot blast. Patented by James Beaumont Nellison at Wismont you know, Iron Works in Scotland in 1828. This further reduced production cost. Within a few decades, the practice was so was to have a stove as large as the furnace next into the into which the waste gas containing carbon monoxide which is co from the furnace was directed and burnt the resultant heat was used to preheat the air blow into the furnace further significant development was the application of raw, uh, raw anthracite coal to the blast furnace, first tried successfully by George Crane at Eurysendim uh, in Ironworks in South Wales, in England again, in 1837. It was taken up in America by the Lane Crane Iron Company at uh, Catasgoa, Pennsylvania in 1839. Modern furnaces, let's, you know, this are history. I'm giving you the history of the blast furnace. How it, you know, blast furnace started from nowhere, and then the transformation of blast furnace and the improvement in blast furnaces. You need to know that. So you need it to know the history of what you are going to deal with. Now, the modern furnaces, blast furnace remain an important part of modern iron production. Modern furnaces are highly efficient, including copper stoves to preheat the blast air and employ recovery system to extract the heat from the hot gases existing in the furnace. Competition in industry drives higher production rates. The largest blast furnace have a volume of 5,580 cubic meter, uh, uh, cubic meter uh, years, cubic meter, which is about 190 thousand cubic feet and can produce around 80,000 tons to 88,000 short tons of iron, week, iron per week. This is a great increase from the typical 18th century furnaces which average about 630 tons to 400, 400 uh, short tons to 400,000 short tons per year. Variations of the blast furnace, such as the Swedish electric blast furnace, 
we call it electric arc, develop in countries which have no native coal resources. Modern process. The modern furnaces are equipped with an array of supporting facilities to increase efficiency, such as such as all uh, storage yards where barges and unload are uh, unloaded. The raw materials are transferred to the stockhouse complex by all bridges or rail hoppers or, or transfer cars. Rail mounted scale cars or computer control weight hoppers weigh out the various raw materials to yield the desire to hot metal and slag chemistry. The raw materials are brought to the top of the blast furnace via a skip car, you know, it goes via a skip car poured by witches uh, or conveyor belts. These are different ways in which the raw materials are charged into the blast furnace in those uh, yeah, blast furnace. Some blast furnaces use a double bell system where Two bells are used to control the entry of raw materials into the blast furnace. The purpose of the two bell bells is to minimize the loss of hot gases in the blast furnace. First, the raw materials are emptied into the upper small bell, which then opens to empty, to empty the charge into the large bell. The small bell, the small bell then closes to seal the blast furnace, while the large bell uh, rotates to provide specific distributions of materials before dispersing the charge into the blast furnace. A more recent design is to use a bellless system. This system uses multiple hoppers to contain, to contain each raw materials, which is then discharged into the blast furnace through valves. These valves are more accurate and controlling how much of each constituent is, absor uh, is added as it compared to the skip conveyor system thereby increasing the efficiency of the furnace. Some of these bell less system also Im implement a discharge chute in the throat of the furnace as with the pole wood top in order to precisely control where the charge is placed. The iron making blast furnace itself is built in the form of tall structure lined with refractory brick and profiled to allow to, uh, for expansions of the, of the charge materials as they heat during their descent. And, so, and subsequent re, uh, reduction in size as melting starts to occur, coke limestone flux and iron or iron oxide are charged into the top of the furnace in a precise filling order, which helps control gas flow and the chemical reactions inside the furnace. For optics, allow the hot Dirty gas high in carbon monoxide content to exist the furnace throat while bleeder valves protect the top of the furnace from sudden gas pressure surges. The coarse particles in the exhaust gas settled in the dust catcher and are dumped into a railroad car or truck for a disposal while the gas itself flows through the Venturi scuba and or electron electrostatic uh, precipitators and a gas cooler to reduce the temperature of the clean gas. Now, the the cast house at the bottom of the furnace contains the uh, the bustle pipe, water cooled copper, tire rays, and the equipment for casting the liquid iron and slag. Once a tap, a tap hole is drilled through the refractory clay plug, liquid iron and slag flow down 
at the trough through a skimmer, opening, separating the iron and slag. Modern larger blast furnace, furnaces may have as many as four tap holes and two cast houses. Once the pig iron and slag has been tapped, the tap holes is again plug, uh, plunged with refractory clay. The TRS are used to implement hot blast, which is used to increase the efficiency of the blast furnace. The hot blast is directed into the furnace through water cooled copper nozzles called the tuyeres near the base. The hot blast temperature can be can be from 900 degrees Celsius to 1,300 degrees Celsius, or which is about 1,600 degrees Fahrenheit to about 2,300 degrees Fahrenheit, depending on the stove design and condition. The temperature they deal with may be cool from 2,000 degrees Celsius to 2,300 degrees Celsius, which is about 3,600 degrees Fahrenheit to about 4,200 degrees Fahrenheit. Oil, tar, natural gas, powder, coal, and oxygen can also be injected into the furnace at a two-year level to combine with the coke to release the additional energy increase in the percentage of reducing gases present, which is necessary to increase productivity. Now, the next thing, I have just given you the synopsis about blast furnace of uh, production of uh, pig ions. Now, let's look at the processing engineering, we call process engineering and chemistry of this. So this is where we talk about the chemical reactions, what is happening in the, in the furnaces and how the different, uh, you know, minerals are reacting and forming and, you know, either decomposing or uh, or reacting together to form something, uh, to form a, a metal, you know, with the separation of the gases. So let's look at that. Blast furnaces operate on the principle of chemical reduction, which is chemical reaction, where, whereby carbon monoxide have a stronger affinity of the oxygen in iron ore than iron does, reduces the iron to its element, elemental form. Blast furnace differ from bloomeries and li li uh, reverberatory furnaces in that in a blast furnace, flue gas is intimate contact with the ore and iron allowing carbon monoxide to diffuse into the ore and reduce the iron oxide to elemental iron mixed with carbon. The blast furnaces operate as a countercurrent exchange process, whereas a bloomery does not. Another difference is that bloomeries operate as a batch process, while blast furnaces operate continuously for a long period of period because they are difficult to start up and shut down. Continuous production. So in blast furnaces, you have continuous production because to shut it down is a hard. Also, the carbon in pig iron lowers the melting point below that of steel or pure iron. In contrast, iron does not melt in bloomery. Carbon monoxide also reduces silica, which has to be removed from the pig iron. The silica is reacted with calcium oxide, bone limestone, and forms a slag which flows to the surface of the molten pig iron. The intimate contact of of a flu gas with the iron causes contamination with sulfur. If it is present, if it is present in the fuel, historically to prevent contamination of, of, from sulfur, the best quality iron was produced with charcoal. The downward moving columns of all flux, coke or charcoal, and reaction products must be porous enough for the flu gas to pass through. This requires the coke of charcoal to be 
in, to be in large enough particles to be permeable, meaning there cannot be excess of fines. Therefore, the cup must be strong enough so it will not be crushed by the weight, the over, over, overhead material beside physical strength of the coke. It must also be low in sulfur, phosphorus, and ash. The necess the necessitate, this necessitates the use of metallurgical coal, which is a premium grade due, due to relative scarcity. The main chemical reaction production the, uh, the production, the molten ion is iron oxide reacts with what? Carbon monoxide and you form iron, you get iron and carbon dioxide. The carbon dioxide is the gas. Then, this reaction might be divided into multiple steps, with the first being that preheated blast air blow into the furnace, react with the carbon in the form of coke to produce carbon monoxide and heat. Now, another phase is having the carbon react with oxygen to form the carbon dioxide. That's the air that you pump in. The hot carbon monoxide is the reducing agent for the iron ore and reacts with the iron oxide to produce molten iron and carbon dioxide. Depending on the temperature in the different parts of the furnace, the warmest of the bottom, the iron is reduced in several steps at the top, where the temperature usually is the range between 200 degrees Celsius to 700 degrees Celsius. The iron oxide is partially reduced to iron oxide, which is F Fe3O4. Now, the Iron oxide reacts with carbon, di uh, carbon monoxide gas. We give you iron. We give you the uh, uh, iron oxide. We give you an iron oxide plus carbon dioxide. Hot carbon dioxide, unreacted carbon monoxide, and nitrogen from the air pass up through the furnace as fresh feed material travels down into the reaction zone. As the material travels downward, the, the countercurrent gases, both the preheat, the feed, change and decompose, decompose the limestone to calcium oxide and carbon dioxide, which gives you carbon dioxide heated up, gives you calcium, uh, uh, calcium oxide plus carbon dioxide gas. So now, as the iron oxide moves down to the area with higher temperature, ranging up to 1,200 degrees Celsius, it reduces further to iron metal. You, are you getting it? Everything is due to, through the process of heating. So iron oxide now reacts with carbon monoxide gas and it produces carbon dioxide, you know, you know, reacts with carbon monoxide, produces iron separately then carbon dioxide gas. Now, <clears throat> the carbon dioxide form in this process is reduced to carbon monoxide by coke. Gives you carbon, reacts with carbon dioxide, gives you carbon, uh, carbon, uh, carbon dioxide, gives you carbon monoxide, which is, again, rotten egg smell, the gas. The temperature, which we call the laughing gas, it, uh, actually, you know, because if you inhale it too much, you're going to continue to ra laugh until you, you drop dead, you know, so it's uncontrollable laugh. The temperature dependent equilibrium controlling the gas or atmosphere in the furnace is called the Bokahorn reaction, which is, uh, the Bokahorn reaction is the uh, reaction on both ways. That means there's a reaction going on this way, and it can be a revert reaction going on that way. So that's what we call Bokor reaction. So the decompositions of limestone in the middle zone of the furnace proceed according to the following reaction. Cation carbonate decomposed to cation oxide and carbon, di carbon dioxide. The cation oxide formed by decomposition reacts with the various acidic impurities in the ion Notably silica to form a 
phyalytic slag, which is essentially calcium silicate. And calcium silicate is a CaSiO3. Now, when you react the silicate oxide, react with calcium oxide, we have found you from the uh, calcium silicate. Then let's continue to look at the pig, the pig ion. The pig ion produced by the blast furnace has a relatively high carbon content of the around 4 to 5%, making it very brittle uh, of, uh, and of limited immediate uh, commercial use. Some pig ion is used to make cast iron. The majority of pig iron produced by blast furnaces undergoes further processing to reduce the carbon content and produce various grades of steel used for construction materials, automobiles, ships, and machinery. Although the efficiency of blast furnace is constantly evolving, the chemical process inside the blast furnace remains the same. According to the American Iron and Steel Institute, blast furnaces will survive into the next millennium because the, the larger efficient furnace can produce hot metal at cost com competitive with other iron making te technologies. One of the biggest drawbacks of the blast, of the blast furnace is the inevitable carbon dioxide production as iron is reduced from iron oxide by carbon and there is no economical substitute. Steel making or steel making is one of the unavoidable industrial contributors of the carbon dioxide emission in the world. The challenge set by the greenhouse gas emission of the blast furnace is being addressed in an ongoing European program called ULCOS, Ultra Low Carbon Dioxide Steel Making. Several new process routes have been pro proposed and investigated in depth to cut specific emission of carbon dioxide per ton of steel by at least 50%. Some rely on, on the capture and further storage of CCS, of carbon dioxide, which others choose uh, decarbonizing iron and steel produ production by turning to hydrogen electricity and biomass. In the nearer term, a technology that incorporates CCS into the blast furnace process itself and is called the top gas recycling blast furnace in other development with a scale up to commercial size blast furnace underway. The technology should be fully demonstrated by the end of the 2010. By the end of the 2010, you know, which is already happening. So because we are in 20, 2012 right now. So, so that was the initial logic. By the end of 2020, sorry, by the end of 2020, in line with the time set for the example by the EU, that's the European Union, to, to cut emissions significantly broad deployment could take place in 2030. Manufacture of stone wool. A stone wool or rock wool is a spun mineral fiber used as an insulation product and uh, in a hydroponic in manufacture in a blast furnace fed with a uh, diabase rock with a, which, which contains very low levels of metal oxides. The resultant slag is drawn off and spun to form a rock wool product. Very small amounts of, met of metals are also produced, which are, on, which are unwanted by products and run to waste. The commission blast furnace as museum sites. For a long time, it was normal procedure for the, comp the commission blast furnace to be demolished and either be replaced with a newer, improved one or to have the entire site demolished to make room for follow-up use of area. In recent decades, several countries have realized the value of blast furnace 
as a part of their industrial history rather than being demolished, abandoned, steel bills were turned into museums or integrated into multi-purpose uh, parks. The largest number of preserved historic blast furnaces exist in Germany. Other, than, other such sites exist in Spain, in France, in Czech, in Czech, in Re in Czech Republic, in Japan, in Luzburg, in Poland, in Romania, in Mexico, in Russia, and the United States. So we have them all over the world, except Africa, who, have, who, who Nigeria could have been part of this. Even in India, we have them now, in India. It's not on the list yet, so I include it, because India have them. India started their steel production at the same time with Nigeria, and now they have gone high. And now that's why India are, uh, are moving um, in the techno are moving to match the world in technological age because they have chosen to embark on steel production. So um, you know, I will include India, even though it's here, it's not you know, it, it, you know, the world has not recognized them as the, the best steel, steel uh, producer. So, uh, but they are getting there. You know, so Indians are actually doing so well to, to catch up with the rest of the world, while Nigerians, we are taking the back seat. Now, in all of this, I strongly urge with this lecture to call and call the government of Nigeria, you know, to uh, seriously look into the uh, production of steel by different methods. You know, the blast furnace is still there in Najakuta, which was uh, created by the Russians, and yet is never used. So there's nothing wrong with it, with it for us to start getting our oil from Itape and transporting it to Ajakuta on, on you know to be used in the uh, in, in the in the blast for this you know I remember vividly when uh, uh, the Ajakuta were to be constructed it was supposed to come with blast for this oxygen converter uh, electro axe steel making and forging so all of this an open heart. You know, so all of these things, method of making steel, were supposed to be in existence in Ajakuta steel production. And yet, we have not even be, begun to do anything in Ajakuta since uh, 19, in 1979 or 1980, whatever, over 30 years ago, when steel production was embarked seriously back on in Nigeria. Now, I urge uh, people who are listening to this thing, so this, I am a, a, a metallurgist. We have a lot of Nigerians who are metallurgists, and yet, you know, uh, our country is not you, you know, is not you, uh, tapping into the expertise of these metallurgists to really go out there and do something for the country. You know, if they are challenged, they will produce because they, they studied the same thing I did. So. You know, I, if, I'm not in Nigeria because if I'm in Nigeria, obviously my brain will go to waste because there's no nothing to, to steer this thing. But we have people who are as capable as me or even better than me who are in Nigeria who are wasting. So let Nigerian government, you know, use this opportunity to begin the steel production in Nigeria. You know, uh, to those of you who are listening to my lecture, I am very passionate about this because I know that in order for any nation to, to forge ahead, still technology is the way to go. You know, we can't rely on our oil for the rest of our lives. You know, the oil is going to finish, the steel production will be there. You know, iron ore is rich in Africa everywhere. We have it at, at the purest stage, but they are wasted because our country is not willing to embark on it. So for those of you listening to my um, lecture today, uh, don't be frustrated of going into uh, being an engineer in the steel production or to be a metallurgical engineer. So if, that's, if you really find it interesting, go for it because it's a very interesting engineering course. And I'm very sure and I'm still very hopeful that in future, our country will be able to go into steel production and then put a lot of uh, our young uh, metallurgists to work and uh, uh, experts in you know, chemical engineers, mechanical engineers, all kind of engineering who can work in steel production, you know, because they also have parts to play. You know, some, the, the production of steel will give rise to ma uh, machinability, to machine building, to car building, to aeroplane, to aeroplane building, to um, uh, 
what we call it, uh, uh, in, in civil engineering, industrial building. So all of these things still is the foundation. So when you get this, the country will be heavily rich. You know, I'm very passionate about it. So I, at this time, I will conclude my uh, lecture number four. You know, so I have delivered lecture one, two, three, and today is the lecture number four. So, you know, this is the end of the lecture about the blasphemies and what the blasphemy stands for. The, starting from the history, I gave you the history of blasphemies. Uh, we run down to the uh, chemical decomposition of uh, the chemical reactions in blasphemies and the com how the materials are being conveyed to blasphemies. So, all of these things, we talked about it and, the, and how uh, ion is formed in blasphemies. And actually, we get the pig ion. Eventually, we have the charcoal. We have the um, the slags. The slag is reused because the slag is very important, so nothing goes to waste. So, you know, I, I want you to know that the end products of uh, of uh, blasphemies is you get the pig ion and you get the slag. You no, know, you get the slag, you get the pig ion. Both are things that we need because those things can be used and sold and make, you know, Nigeria can be, be, be rich with it. So even the uh, residual materials that we're getting, we think that is a waste. It's actually not a waste because it's really very good in road construction, in building bridges, in doing so many things. So thank you so much for your listening here to listen to the uh, steel making, production of iron and steel making using the blast furnace. There's other things that will follow. I will, in the, my next lecture, I will talk, literally talk about the open heart and maybe oxygen converter. And so I may combine those two things and talk it in my fifth lecture. So thank you so much. God bless.